All right, guys, welcome back to Introduction to Language and Society. Um, I'm going to first start by uh, sharing my screen. Share screen, yes. And this is a recording for lecture number four on language attitudes. And um, this was last week's lecture and I'm going to make it available for you on our course management system. So let's start with language attitudes. First of all, what are language attitudes in general? Um, um, first definition is um, it relates to the feelings people have about their own language variety. You can replace feelings with attitudes, of course. Uh, so feelings of people about their own language uh, variety or quote unquote dialect or the languages or language varieties of others. And <clears throat> some attitudes can be summarized as follows. These are just examples, remember. For example, people say women talk too much. This is not a language attitude, but it is just maybe a stereotype, a negative stereotype, of course. Uh, or another attitude would be things like um, more relating to language, you would say. Children can't speak or write properly anymore. And this also gives you an indication about the age of the person telling or quoting this statement. Another language attitude is in the Appalachians, they speak like Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Black children are verbally deprived. So remember when we talked about African-American vernacular English, um, we said that the code spoken at home and the code spoken in school or taught in school are different. So there is a mismatch between what is being spoken at home and um, what is being taught in the main medium of education. So we have a little mismatch here. So this is one of the attitudes that can be more prescriptive. And another attitude is they speak really bad English down south and in New York City. So you can see these are, this is just a few attitudes. Another one is everyone has an accent except me. But that's not true, everyone has an accent, in fact. Um, an attitude from Singapore would be more of a prescriptive stance, of course. Singlish is not good English. Another one is speak good English is the best English, or maybe promoting good English in Singapore and arguing which English is the best. So all of these are a few, a kind of a snapshot of all the types of attitudes you can have, ranging from the US to uh, Singapore to other places in the world. And everybody has different attitudes when it comes to using language. Uh, you can think about other attitudes. You can add more if you have. Uh, and in a way, uh, we cannot escape attitudes. We always have some attitudes. Of course, we're talking about language attitudes here, right? What are the implications of uh, language attitudes? Well, um, language attitudes usually mean or entail attitudes to speakers, not just to language. So we start to, we start to attribute certain characteristics or features to the speakers of these languages or dialects. And there is evidence, as we saw two weeks ago, that language attitudes influence sound change. Remember the case of Martha's Vineyard, that island, where people started to have different attitudes towards the visitors, the summer visitors. And with time, unconsciously, there was a change in sounds and pronunciation. So in a way, this is an important variable because attitudes can impact the way phonemes or phonological features can change. Case in point, Martha's Vineyard. Uh, language attitudes may also influence how teachers deal with uh, students or pupils, meaning they will promote certain ways of speaking and they will look down on other ways of speaking or other varieties. Another possible implication is that attitudes about language may affect, affect second language learning hindering it or promoting it or maybe encouraging it. So if there is a certain way of speaking, which is valued by teachers, um, that will probably get more positive feedback in the second language classroom. 
And language attitudes may affect whether or not varieties are mutually intelligible. So you remember the case of um, certain varieties which are very close, like in the Scandinavian countries. So if people would consider that these varieties are different languages, not mutually intelligible, then they will, they will have different attitudes towards them. Uh, there is a short video I want to show you about uh, accents and attitudes because uh, there's a large body of research in um, so sociology of language and sociolinguistic that relates to accents and attitudes towards accents. So let me show you this video. It is taken from a famous um, TV series called Friends. And it's still available now, it's still ongoing on Netflix. So I'm going to show you this short video and I'd like to ask you a question after the video. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video here and um, I will upload it to our course group, but you get the point, right? Some questions about this. In this clip from Friends, what, why does Phoebe change her accent in your opinion? Why do, does she change her accent? So this is food for thought. I want you to consider these questions and think about it. Why does she change her accent and what does her accent sound like after she changes it? What does she try to emulate? Or what does she try to imitate? Which type of accent does she try to imitate? So you can, you can think about it. She's trying probably to appear more educated, more sophisticated, maybe more posh, to belong to another social group, socioeconomic class, to be liked, to be accepted. So in, in this short clip, in a way we have, um, an idea about how language attitudes are mediated through accents, right? So think about the following statements now. Do you agree or disagree with the following statements? You can tell a lot about a person by the way they talk. My language use at home is different from my language use at school. Learning to do a new job can involve learning new ways to use language. I adapt the way I talk depending on the people involved. Communication difficulties cause interpersonal problems. And communication difficulties cause political problems. So all of these are different attitudes or maybe um, stances towards language and language use. Now there is a very important concept which probably we'll be talking about for the rest of the semester which is the notion of linguistic capital. And as you can see here, there's a picture of a, of a guy. Uh, you might have guessed his name is Bourdieu, Pierre Bourdieu. He's a French sociologist. And he argued that linguistic exchanges invoke a complex network of power relations in which the producer, the speaker, by producing an utterance, or text makes a bid for social authority. And the recipients or audience decides to what degree to recognize that claim to authority. So every time we're talking in a way, we are making a claim or a bid for social authority through the way we speak. 
our accent, for example, and the audience is going to either legitimate that or maybe turn it down. And he introduces the notion of linguistic capital. Now we all know that capital is usually associated with money, with economy. And to say that someone has capital means that they can invest, that they can purchase, they have buying power. But we are not so familiar with the notion of linguistic capital. So Bourdieu is the first, among the first people who introduced the notion of linguistic capital. So he is associating monetary value to language, meaning that if you have linguistic capital, then you are respected. You have higher authority as a speaker. And if you have linguistic capital, you have command, you have more power to influence a listener toward the desired interpretation. And our speech or our utterances are always ventured in a particular field or a marketplace in which there are certain social expectations for speech and interaction. In a linguistic market or marketplace, Bourdieu argues that people undertake speech production with a certain anticipation of profit, trying to, to get some reward, beneficial rewards, of course, or anticipation of the expected reception of their words. Therefore, according to him, linguistic capital is created, adapted, asserted, and re-evaluated through linguistic encounters. And linguistic production is governed by the notion of habitus. So we will talk about this next week. Um, what is habitus? In simple terms, habitus is the historically or socially constituted sedimentation. You know, sedimentation is what happens in geology. With time, there will be different layers of earth crust with different stones, different minerals. And he says that linguistic habitus, the sedimentation is the sedimentation of habits, of experiences, of attitudes, of stances. With time, they become, they become established um, in the linguistic markets. And these sedimented habits or habitus are internalized inclinations towards certain types or styles of linguistic production or maybe linguistic forms, which is considerably shaped by one's personal history or social interaction, and also one's sense of the value of one's language. Now, moving on to attitudes, we have attitudes and language, but we are going to add another variable to the equation. Attitudes, language, and gender. Now, when you look at the display of these words in different colors, do you notice anything? Is there anything you can mention here? Well, what I can tell you first, maybe you can also look at other words as well, is that um, sometimes there is an imbalance towards the female gender. So for example, um, we don't talk about sales woman, usually it's sales girl, but sales man. So there is an imbalance um, in the terms. Sometimes we don't, we actually say salesman, but we, it's not, the, the, the equivalent is not always sales woman, it's sales girl. So why is it salesman and not sales woman? While, while they, why is there no sales boy, for example, right? And then um, cleaning lady, well, we don't say cleaning girl, but lady doesn't mean that the cleaning lady is old. Uh, so lady usually is, is uh, associated with um, a little bit older female population, but we don't say cleaning girl. But why don't we say sales lady? So you see, um, sometimes uh, <laughs> the, there is an attitude towards different terms of address. Why don't we say, why is it master? And why is the word mistress not used? A mistress has a little bit different implications than master, right? So this is just to raise your uh, awareness about some words that are not value free. 
we also have words, uh, we also have attitudes towards terms of address and also uh, labels, okay? And these are, these are also have um, implications for gender. And we will talk about gender in another chapter or another lecture. Um, <laughs> gender stereotypes. So according to uh, people who have talked about uh, gender stereotypes and the second wave of feminism, I believe, I'm not really familiar with it, but um, sex is what you're born with, gender is what you're given. Um, and we see that gender stereotypes, like you see in the toys uh, given in this little comic strip, action men, men or boys are more action oriented, girls are more passivity oriented. Is that true? Is that not true? Um, there can be a sociological study about toys that are sold on the market and how um, boys' toys are usually more um, action-oriented. There's a lot of um, action figures. There's a lot of movement and, you know, for example, vehicles, cars, uh, motorcycles, um, balls. So it's usually actions and conflicts. And girls, it's more domestic. For example, it's more like doll dolls or kitchen wear, cooking, cooking wear, or things like it's a more passive role. Um, so you can make, you, may, you can actually have an idea by yourself. You can actually survey, you can go to uh, any toy store and um, get an idea for yourself. I don't want to, to I don't want to actually uh, influence your perspectives on things. So um, coming back to attitudes and gender stereotypes, we talk about slang terms for women, such as baby, chick, kitten, et cetera, et cetera. Some of them are a little bit demeaning. Some of them are not just demeaning, they are insulting. And some of them uh, objectify like cupcakes, food usually, tart. Um, and other attitudes tend to say that women usually are very sophisticated in their choice of color terms. You know, there's a high nuance of different colors. When women talk about colors, it's different from uh, when men talk about colors. There's a very highly specialized vocabulary or um, accurate choice of terms. It's not any color, it's just beige. It's not just white or it's not, it's not purple, it's mauve. It's not um, orange, it's peach. So I think you know what I mean. And another arguments by people who say that there are gender stereotypes and attitudes towards gender which, where we see the imbalance between men and women. And they say there's a male perspective on things where male, males are the norm. For example, man is in many words like mankind, male man, policeman, poor man. Of course, now many words have their female equivalent like police woman, uh, but some words still are more gender uh, one-sided. Um, for example, the verb to man, something to man a machine is to handle or to operate it. Okay. Gender biases in language. There's a negative connotation in the female alternative of a pair. Um, we say bachelor, but spinster. Um, master, mistress, as I told you earlier, right? Um, and there is a need to benchmark the female with the male. For example, why do we say Mr. for a man who is both married and single? Well, we have to differentiate so much for a woman who's either married, unmarried, or who wants to hide her um, status. So you see one label for men, but three or four labels for women. Um, so that's an interesting thing, right, to talk about. Male, world, male, male words are sometimes or usually the basic terms, doctor, female doctor, manager, manageress, the adding of the suffix. Women as necessarily defined by their role in the household, unmarried mother, working mother, working father, doesn't really sound right because it's not very common to hear that. And uh, for example, when you talk about someone who is a judge, 
some of the description needs to add things like Mary Godwin, mother of two, as in a side note, became the first female high court judge. Or Professor Ms. Suzanne Romain, uh, but Professor John Smith, no need for the MS, meaning uh, status. Um, <laughs> marital status is indicated in women's um, scriptures, but not for guys or, or men. Okay. Other things to talk about are semantic shift or semantic derogation. Uh, terms that start off describing women in neutral or positive terms, then slowly acquire negative connotations, indicative of social attitudes towards them. So we have some examples that you can read here. I'll just take the first one. A girl, originally a child, with time, with semantic derogation or semantic shit, started to become associated with an unmarried woman, she's a girl, or a sweetheart. And then with time and with even more semantic derogation became associated with prostitute or with a black woman, girl, right? In slang, in African-American vernacular English. You can see other examples here where um, terms change with time and with different uses. Now, there is a very important uh, notion here that I'd like you to uh, pay attention to, and it's called linguistic relativism or determinism. And it, it originally started with the works of Sapir and Wirth. One was the teacher, the other was the student, but um, it is called linguistic relativity or relativism or determinism. It means that there is a thing or a concept, and then that concept gets processed through our minds, and then that creates language. Or um, I will show you a bit later. So just to, to comment on this, language not only represents our thoughts and our understandings of reality, it also shapes and determines, that's why it's called determinism. Language determines or shapes our thoughts. Means, what, it, what does it mean basically? It's a tool for interpreting our perceptions, our view of the world. Means that through my language, I am, I'm kind of deciphering or understanding the world. But uh, no, before I say, I talk about that. So our thoughts determine our, our language. So we choose our language based on our thoughts. And then the other way around is that language is a prism or kaleidoscope through which we see the world, okay? So one version is to say that our thoughts that we have here in our brains will create a certain language to talk about it. So abstract thoughts will need, for example, a certain, certain terms, certain specialized language to be used. But then the other way around is to say that language, language we speak that we have internalized is the prism through which we process, we understand the world, we decipher or we perceive the world. So either the arrow goes from, from left to right or from right to left, both of these are called linguistic uh, relativism or determinism. And um, these are two versions of linguistic relativism or relativity. One is a strong version, the top one, and the, the one at the bottom is, a weaker version, but basically it shows you that uh, it is not a unidirectional model. It goes both ways. And linguistic um, determinism can have an interesting implications because um, different languages of the world have uh, different terms for color. So for example, English have this color prism or color grades we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven colors in English with seven basic uh, color terms, violet, blue, cyan, green, yellow, orange, orange, and red. But in other languages of the world, like Shona and Basa, Shona is a Bantu language of Shona people of Zimbabwe in Africa. And Basa is um, also an African language, but it's spoken in Liberia and Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. But what does this say? It means that these two languages actually group certain colors together. They don't have, they don't perceive 
violet and blue as being two separate colors, but they are grouped together under one term, which is Chipa Uka. And Vasa, it's even more extreme if I dare say extreme, but they have basically two, two, uh, two colors or two color associations. Anything from violet to light green is called hul, and anything from dark green to yellow, or rather from light green to, uh, to red is actually called ziza. So they have basically two color uh, groups. Oh, interesting, right? Because this has inter interesting implication. Does it mean that they don't see the other levels of colors because they don't have words to uh, term them or to call them? So if you don't have a term for a color, does it mean you don't see that color or do you group it as one? That's very interesting, I would say. Uh, and we will talk about this um, a bit later. Breaking, breaking gender stereotypes and attitudes. Girls are made of sugar, spice, and all things nice. This is a, a funny saying that we hear a lot. Women love to gossip and talk more than men do. These are all attitudes to uh, gender uh, mediated by language. And some people also say that women use a lot of tag questions. You know, for example, a tag question is, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? That's a tag question, then, meaning that women are uncertain or unsure of themselves. Um, is it true? Is it false? We will talk about that. And there are other attitudes or stereotypes that women are more polite and self-conscious about using standard forms, indicating um, a sense of insecurity. And the term insecurity has been also used uh, when we talked about Lebov's, Lebov's study social stratification. Breaking gender uh, attitudes and stereotypes, um, using the term MES and S to neutralize the discrimination caused by having two forms of reference to distinguish between the married and unmarried status, MES and MESs of females. But this doesn't have a counterpart for males. So males don't have a counterpart of MES it's Mr. Whether you're married or unmarried, and we we talked about this example, male nurse. We need to add male nurse because usually nurse is associated to um, to females, right? Lady doctor is less frequent nowadays because doctor can refer to both genders, but nurse maybe ninety percent of the cases refers to a woman, but if you are talking about a man who is practicing this, this profession, then you have to add male nurse. Okay. Um, question here, should sexist language be changed or can it be changed? Again, some people would say no, it cannot be changed and it should not be changed. And they say, they argue that there is no relation between language and social reality because even if you change language, it will not change reality. So people say, all right, language is sexist, but what can you do about it? Can you change it? Does, does changing language will inevitably change reality? People would say, no, it doesn't change reality. And they will, uh, they will add to the arguments that it's actually language reflects reality. And what we need to do is to change reality. So. If reality changes, then language will change, but not the other way around. So we don't need to change language. We have to change reality first because language won't change. And some people will go the opposite way and they will say, yes, sexist language can be changed because uh, since language determines the way in which we view and experience reality, uh, change in social reality can only occur through language first. So we have to change language first. And language not only reflects social reality, but also shapes it, it shapes it. So you see, those are the two forms of uh, linguistic relativism that we talked about earlier. Language is a prism through which we look at reality or life, but life also helps us to change language or to mold language. So this something for you to think about. You must have your own opinion about it. And I'm curious about what you think. So think about it and let me know next time what you have in mind. 
Now, a very interesting notion, uh, or maybe I would call it an expression, is called verbal hygiene and politically correct language. Verbal, we know oral hygiene is when, for example, you brush your teeth or you floss, that's called oral hygiene. But verbal hygiene, what is it? Verbal hygiene is when you make your language more polite or more refined, you don't use maybe bad language, incorrect language, and you try not to offend people by using politically correct language. That's verbal hygiene. You are, you are making your language more clean or maybe you are trying to um, gloss the language so that uh, it sounds nicer and better. So verbal hygiene, um, in order for us to understand it, we can look at the use of generic reference terms. <clears throat> for example, how to change attitudes to different um, genders. For example, men, are, women are inferior because of certain terms. So what do people decide to do? They say, let us change the words, the uh, suffixes of certain words, for example, chairman, postman, what can we do? We are going to change those uh, men to women, postwoman, chairwoman, or maybe use generic reference terms, for example, chairperson instead of chairman. That's more gender neutral, so the attitude will be not uh, biased. Uh, we will also think that maybe using gender inclusive terms instead of he or she, they will be the pluralized form of the singular so that we don't, we hide the gender. We don't assign only one gender. Uh, use of ge uh, gender, gender neutral uh, nouns, as I said earlier, instead of man, you have chairperson, sportsperson, shop assistant, not uh, sales girl, postal worker, not postman, okay? And of course, this is different depending on the language you're speaking. Some languages don't have that issue. Uh, and some other languages, there's no way around it, for example, because there's clear gender marking. Uh, in some uh, languages, you can use one word and just add one sound, which is uh, suffix, which is a feminine marker or masculine marker. So that's very hard to, to modify. Redu reduction in gender stereotyping, for instance, use of the alternative titles for women. So all of these are initiatives in order to redress the imbalance. I would say redressing the imbalance in attitudes towards different genders. And um, we also have this notion of making the language more politically correct. And that's an initiative of verbal hygiene that everybody every now and then decides to uh, initiate in order to not offend, for example, certain groups, certain minorities. So people wouldn't say things like the old people or the aged but senior citizens, blind rather use visually impaired. And you see all the examples. And um, I think this is becoming more and more frequent now nowadays. Nowadays, um, it's a social it's a social phenomenon that language is becoming more politically correct. So people like George Carlin, this guy here on the image, I'm going to post this video uh, of George Carlin, and I want you to open it so you can interrupt the video later of the lecture, and uh, you can open his video. And he talks about politically correct language and he is kind of using a sarcastic tone because he says that uh, he doesn't believe in that. It's just um, whether changing the language will change society or will changing society will affect language. That's a debate that we talked about. Now, reclaiming derogatory terms. Um, some words have changed with time and for example, as you can see, some words have been appropriated by some minorities. For example, um, the word, the, the word, the N-word, nigger, for instance, it's a bad negative word, it's an insult. However, the, why the title of this slide says reclaiming is because within a group of African-Americans, that term can be reclaimed to call, to use, 
to um, talk to each other or to call each other by that term, but that's not a term of, uh, it's not an insulting term in that case. However, if it's used by, by an outsider to refer to one of the community uh, members or, or, or the group members, then it's perceived as an insult. So you see a reclaiming of those terms, but they are used by the, by the in-group, by the members of the group. Okay. So you can see um, all of these have the different situation or context to explain them. Um, I'm posting some of these videos for you guys. And if you click on the PowerPoint, you will see links uh, about using certain words, the N word, uh, which is actually a very emotionally and historically loaded word. It's, uh, it's very bad to use this word in context of the US, for instance. And then um, the comedian Russell Peters is talking about different words for races and all that, uh, which have different attitudes uh, connected to, to them. So I'm going to ask you to invite you to, to uh, view the videos uh, yourself because it will be more convenient for you to just watch them without interrupting the lecture. And some of the interesting things that are happening um, also currently is that those words that are loaded, that are stigmatized, that are politically incorrect, like this word nigger, for instance, um, people even don't say that word in the US, you say the N word. Um, if you travel back in time in 1885, and you read um, a novel called The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, chapter 20, Mark Twain, this word is present uh, in the novel. However, um, that term has been removed in later editions, in later editions of uh, the book, because it was deemed inappropriate to use um, the word in the current day and age. Uh, and you can see this is not the only initiative. Uh, it happened also with other books, for instance, um, um, you can read about other terms as well, like engines, uh, slave, nigger. So in both books here, I can read this for you. In both books, Auburn University English professor Adam Gribben has replaced nigger with slave. Well, um, thinking that this will be more acceptable, he has substituted all references of Indian with Indian as if that will make either, either the Cherokee or the Hindu, or the Hindus any happier. So you see that um, every time uh, with, when time passes, there will be a reclaiming of those terms. But in this case, there's kind of a politically correct verbal hygiene, cleaning up of those words because they are symptomatic of certain negative episodes of history. And this happened in other cases, like you see uh, the original title of And Then There Were None um, was Ten Little Niggers. Now it's changed later. So earlier editions of the novel, and then there were none, was called 10 little niggers. Okay, so these are just some examples of terms which have negative attitudes or connotations of race, racism, etc. So which comes, which brings us to the next part of language attitudes after talking about gender and then switching slowly with a transition to race, we're gonna talk about it. And there's a movie here called Airplane. It's an old movie, 1980. And uh, it talks about jive, which is an older, maybe a term for AAV, African-American vernacular English. And you can see that the attitudes towards it are almost um, comedic, comedic, making fun of it a little bit. But nowadays, probably this movie will not receive uh, that much that much uh, positive reviews because um, currently maybe this version or this way of speaking uh, wouldn't be laughed at, okay? So at that time in 1980, maybe it was not accepted as a legitimate variety of speaking uh, English. So a different variety of speaking English, which is African-American vernacular English. Um, but uh, nowadays, maybe um, this movie will not be, there won't be that many laughs, I would say. So 
you can check it out. I've provided a link for you just by clicking the image of this movie poster. So these are just follow-up questions. Since I haven't played the movie, you can just go ahead and look at it, watch it, and then you can react to the questions. But just as a, the bottom point here, uh, there's a recurring theme in terms of attitudes towards race and language, uh, which is different from different standards of English, which is African-American vernacular English is a recognized variety nowadays. Nowadays in 2021, people legitimate or recognize that this is um, standalone legitimate variety of English. It's not a baby English or, you know, uneducated way of speaking or any other stigma associated with it, but now uh, it's legitimated. Language attitudes, attitudes about language are learned. They are not inherent. They aren't logical or natural. People develop them with time by being exposed to them throughout their environment. So different people will have different attitudes and they will grow up having these attitudes. So there is no such thing as an objectively beautiful or stupid or easy to understand language or dialect. It's a socially constructed notion. So these attitudes, you can say they, they come to stick to certain languages. They, they come to become associated with them. They are not born with the language. And because language is flexible and somewhat uh, controllable, criticizing someone's language is a more socially acceptable way of attacking a person. So because you're not attacking the person frontally, frontally on, on themselves or on their person, you can attack their language. That's supposed to be more acceptable. Of course not. And attitudes are complex. They can contain positive and negative aspects. For example, we often see people describe standard dialects as intelligent, but local dialects as honest, down to earth, uh, honest, uh, maybe simple, right? So we associate certain labels, certain adjectives with uh, certain ways of speaking, standard forms, more educated, more honest, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is something that um, every variety or every language of the world will tend to have. And often language attitudes have to do with group status and group solidarity. So I'm gonna explain this and uh, I'm gonna explain it probably in the next lecture, not today. So for example, if we keep talking about race, what are some language attitudes about African-American vernacular English? So in the past, let's say not that, not that long ago, but maybe 10 years ago, African-American vernacular English, AAVE, was considered to be not logical. It was considered to reflect illogical thoughts wild thoughts, untrained, uneducated thoughts. It was also considered to be a sub lower version of standard American English. Uh, it also reflects a deprived background. All of these are attitudes, right? And according to Labov, black children from the ghetto area are said to receive little verbal uh, stimulation, to hear very little uh, well-formed language. And as a result, they are impoverished in their means of verbal expression. It is said that they cannot speak complete sentences, do not know the names of common objects, cannot form concepts or convey logical thoughts. This is back in 1972, when Labov was analyzing the situation of uh, African-American uh, English and how the children from these communities used to have certain stigma associated with the variety they spoke. Now, other variety of the people, uh, even within the African American community, will tend to associate African English with something backward or keeping African Americans back. And this is also, of course, it's um, it's not true. They say that it has no rules. But every language, if it's going to be a language that people speak, it must have rules. It must be systematic. Remember that. And some people will have some attitudes saying that, oh, this is the language of teenagers and rappers. Like um, it's a slang, it's not really spoken by other strata of the population. Or, or like it's not a real language, it's a slang. 
Uh, some people, as I said earlier, within the community uh, have also spoken against African-American vernacular English, discrediting it or maybe saying that it has no internal value. Bill Cosby is one example. And you can read about his, um, maybe about his uh, interviews when he was talking about how Africans, African-Americans should not speak AAVE because it keeps people backward. Now, what are some of the interesting implications for education? Because you know, some of you are teachers or maybe they want to become teachers. And it's interesting to look at attitudes towards certain varieties for teachers. Teachers think of AAV as substandard in the classroom. And there's a tendency to associate this language and the kids that speak it with learning difficulties, meaning that they have, they're a bit slow, even cognitively. If they speak this variety, it means that they are probably not bright kids or they're having learning difficulties. And even if you don't have a negative attitude to AAVE, it's hard to figure out a student's language skills if you do not know the rules of AAVE yourself. As a result and as a consequence, AAVE speaking children are more likely to be misplaced in special educational classes. Special, a, special ed classes are uh, classes where kids need further help, more help, um, more tutoring. So in fact, when maybe a teacher will identify a child as speaking AAVE, they will misplace them. Although the child might be smart or bright or having no problem with uh, different subject matters, they will be misplaced just on the basis of their um, variety spoken. So implicating that teachers will have a different attitude towards certain varieties in the classroom. And this can be also applied in the case of Taiwan, where uh, I'm sure you're familiar that uh, there's some varieties in the classroom in Taiwan that are probably stigmatized and they shouldn't be used. And if some kids or some students use these varieties, maybe the teacher will have certain attitudes towards them, judging that they are not really educated or they're probably coming from poorer background or maybe anything that will amalgamate that variety with a certain level of uh, stigma. Um, there is this case, which is from 1979, Ann Arbor King trial. Ann Arbor, I believe, is in Michigan State. And uh, what is what was this about? This The case is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School uh, children versus or against the Ann Arbor School District. So what happened is that uh, Martin Luther King School had a mixed income, diverse student body. And the families of 11 students from low income housing projects sued the district, sued the, the school district, because they thought that their kids have been put in special education classes because simply on the fact that they spoke AAV. So the parents got angry and they sued the school. And teachers said that they didn't treat the students any differently than other students. So the teacher said that they were innocent of misplacing the students. So what was the court decision? You can actually Google this court uh, decision. The school board was ordered to uh, train teachers. This is very interesting. This is an, a measure of language policy, which we will talk about. Teachers were trained to understand the difficulties faced by AAVE speakers. So there was an initiative to further train and prepare teachers to deal with the variety spoken by students, which was different from the variety taught in schools. And also develop methods for taking AAVE into account when teaching reading. So very interesting because this is a success for uh, stigmatized variety as AAV, which is gaining recognition. So the attitudes are starting to change here. And there's another, um, maybe another field will take us from, from education to uh, modeling. And uh, you can look at the video. It's a famous modeling show where there's a competition of different models and we have uh, a jury, jury of three 
And then we have one of the uh, ca candidates who is uh, black, African-American, and she's speaking a little bit with an AAVE uh, tone or way of speaking. And after you watch the videos, you can actually check how they, they actually, um, maybe they had different attitudes because of the way she spoke. And they said, she just needs to try harder. She needs professional voice coaching. Um, and they said things like uh, AAEVE is deeply ingrained in her because of her upbringing. She should be able to just get rid of it, meaning get rid of her way of speaking AAVE. So this indexes certain negative attitudes and the judges even say it's okay to sound a little black, but not too black. There's an interesting uh, perspective or attitude since we are talking about language attitudes, it shows how certain attitudes can also be found um, in the media, in TV shows towards certain varieties, which will be judged uh, as negative varieties or stigmatized varieties. And of course, because medias have such a strong power over us as viewers, those attitudes of these judges will get carried to us. We will become influenced by the attitudes and ourselves then we will recycle these attitudes. And to end um, the lecture, I have a couple of more slides I want to show you. We have African-American vernacular English in Disney where I showed you last time you can take any of these Disney movies and all of these movies here from early movies like 1941 Dumbo, The Crows to other movies like Hercules. <clears throat> all of these uh, use strategically African-American uh, sometimes um, depicting negative characters. Uh, so it means that the attitudes which are societal towards certain varieties are probably, they can find their source in the media and Disney movies, which condition kids' attitudes for, uh, to become a little bit more later projected in society. So just have a look at those videos. They are just available at the click of your mouse. The highlighted part will take you to YouTube and you can um, listen to the accent or the way of speaking and see what type of attitude you have after that. And why do you, why do you think I put Disney uh, movies? Why does it matter to uh, have Disney movies and how does it relate to language attitudes? Well, this is interesting because I have posted a couple of articles for you guys by Lippy Green that shows how our attitudes are shaped very early. And uh, from childhood, Disney movies can have a huge worldwide impact. And, um, you know, although animation, anime movies are fun and innocent, we think, but sometimes those animes and those uh, animation movies can have lots of ideological things um, maybe ingrained inside that we are not aware of. And we probably, if we read between the lines, we can become more aware of. Um, other attitudes which are shaped by movies uh, our attitudes towards Arabs. Um, and you know, you can take any other race and you can detect attitudes from movies that are usually negative. Uh, and you can identify those by just looking at how those characters or races or nationalities are depicted through stereotypes, through thickening their you know, features of accents, of way of speaking. Um, so have a look at The Real Bad Arab. It's a documentary, it's very interesting. Um, just uh, click on that link and you can check it out. So for next week, uh, if, if you'd like to have a little bit more uh, reading on the content, you can go to Holmes and read chapter 15, go to pages 409 to 438 and read this section which deals with attitudes. And if you have any questions, of course, you can ask me. All right, thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to start the lecture at this point. Thank you.